Learning about security doesn't need to be scary. If you want to ship code securely with confidence, check out the URL below and challenge yourself with thousands of challenges in 29 coding frameworks. Let the games begin. Okay. We good to go? I'll let the few last people find a seat. Morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great turnout. Fantastic. There you go. Very excited to be here. Um, my name is Paul Therio. Uh, I, well, technically, I still work for Mozilla, uh, although this is my last day uh, today. Uh, good timing. <laughs> um, so I'm getting a little bit nostalgic. I'll try not to get uh, too teary, but uh, we're going to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, and we're talking about some of the things that we've been doing at Mozilla over the last, uh, I guess, well, six, six years or so. Um, talking about trying to find and eradicate security bugs using well, static analysis. It's a, probably a fancy word for using grep, but uh, I'm going to go into it in a bit of detail. And, um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an um, introduction to uh, various types of static analysis. It's more a bit around the practicalities of when you're trying to actually use static analysis on a code base. Um, what are the things you run into? Um, what are the mistakes I made? Uh, assumptions that were turned out to be incorrect, that sort of thing. Um, we're going to look at a tool that I wrote uh, in 2013 uh, and then a better approach that my colleague took. Uh, and then I'm also going to look at a tool that I was using well the last couple of years, which is a bit more sophisticated and um, looking at different ways you can use it in the, the bug uh, hunting pipeline. Um, so the premise of this talk, and this is kind of the, the panacea, or where, where we want to get to is for a given security flaw, we should only have to audit for this type of flaw exactly once. Um, a, uh, an American politician put it very succinctly once, something about you get fooled once, well, you shouldn't be able to get fooled again. Um, and that's really what we want to try and do here. So, okay, so what's static analysis, first of all? Um, static analysis is the act of trying to look at a program by looking at its source code and look at uh, how you expect it to behave at runtime. So I guess the best way to explain it is by comparing it to something like dynamic testing or dynamic analysis where you're looking at the program actually running and seeing what the program does. Static analysis is like, are you just taking the code? What's going to actually happen at it runs? Um, there, historically, static analysis has sort of been associated with, um, it's a fairly challenging field. It can be, uh, it's known for sort of being error prone in terms of a lot of false positives. That's sort of um, one of the challenges. It's often... It only really suits certain classes of bugs. A lot of things are just very difficult to work out if you're only just looking at the code base and um, certain problems lend, it, lend itself better to dynamic analysis. But there are a lot of benefits. Um, in theory, you know the complete state of the program. Well, you're the you have the software, you have all the code. In theory, the program is deterministic, so you should be able to work out anything that goes wrong. Um, but yeah, well, let's. I'm going to go into some of the things that you can do, and and some of the things you can, the pitfalls you can fall into. Okay, so traveling back in time, who's here has heard of Firefox OS? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, well, yeah, I'll count that as a success. Um, so Firefox OS launched in late 2013, if I remember correctly, um, or early 2013. Anyways, but um, the first part I'm going to be talking about Firefox OS. Um, Today, I, I, I've been working on all sorts of things at Firefox, and I've done a lot of stuff which is more sort of platform related, but most of the stuff today is going to be JavaScript. Um, and Firefox OS is, uh, has a number of different layers. It's basically Android at the lowest layer um, with some of the application runtime ripped out, and then Firefox sort of put in its place. And Firefox has these extra APIs to allow um, JavaScript to do powerful things like make a phone call, take a photo, that sort of stuff. And then there's no UI for that Firefox, though. It's just the, the uh, Gecko or the, the platform. And then on top of that, everything that you see is actually a web page. So the lock screen, the camera app, the dialer. And in fact, there's a thing called the system app, which controls like the application runtime, the launching of apps. All of that is actually one giant web page, um, which for anyone who's done any web security, that's probably terrifying. Um, so, uh, 
what's one of the big threats we're going to have? So we're talking about a static web page where um, apps are basically iframes. Um, DOM-based XSS, now this is probably familiar to most people in the room, but I thought I'd just cover it because I, I, it's used in a lot of the examples. So DOM-based XSS is where you have a, um, a code flow from some type of untrusted input. Um, so something on the left here, so a source, like something from the URL or maybe from uh, the referrer, or maybe it's input that you've gotten through a post message. Am I that's still working? Yep. Um, and then it flows into some kind of um, sync. And there's different types of execution syncs, uh, different types of syncs that are dangerous. So there's a, there are syncs like document.write that if you have untrusted input that flows into that, you end up with HTML being added to the page that you didn't intend. Um, the, the, the key thing we're worried about is basically ex script execution. So um, some, some untrusted input that then can potentially lead to untrusted JavaScript being run. So here's an example of such a bug that found in everything.me, which is the a third party home screen that we had for one of the early phones. Um, does that? Yes, okay. So in this app, there was a flow that basically took the app name and, and then assigned it to uh, some elements in a HTML. Now that app name, in Firefox OS, because web pages can be apps, uh, app name is basically the title of a web page. Um, as you can imagine, not super trusted. This particular app is the home screen, so it has lots of powers. So if you can end up injecting script here, you could then do things like install other apps, you could do all sorts of badness. Um, so that's exactly the type of issue that we were sort of worried about, and I was dismayed to find. Um, now, in theory, okay, we'll just don't use inner HTML, and maybe we'll be okay. And uh, it turned out there are actually quite a few of these types of bugs. Um, this is from a, a quick search from over the years. Um, but as you can see, there were lots and lots of the similar type of bugs, right? And so we started seeing more and more of these. I found a bunch of these. Some of these are from people in my team. Some of these are external. Um, but we kept seeing especially the same sort of thing where it was just, it was really just down to inner HTML. That was a really common sync that we just developers kept using. So, okay, what's the first thing we do? Okay, well, let's just try and, let's get, try and get rid of that string. Um, can, we, can we maybe just ban that string? So here's a search. So Gaia is the name of this top end layer in Firefox OS. There are 1,824 occurrences of the word inner HTML in Gaia. Um, there maybe wasn't quite that many at the start, but there certainly were by the end. So, okay, this is a big problem, right? Any one of those could potentially be dangerous. Um, okay, well, well, what can we do? Well, we can, first of all, we can observe that we only care about when we're assigning to inner HTML, so we can, okay, we can use a regex. Okay, that gets rid of 800. But there's still a whole set of these that are actually, well, they're not dangerous at all. If you see up there, like, pretty much everything on this page, it's all just assigning a string to inner HTML. Well, that's never going to be a security bug. So we want to get rid of all of those ones we don't care about, but in order to do that, we need to do a little bit of basic static analysis to sort of understand the code. Or what is the real word for understanding code? That means parsing code. Um, so this is 2013, and I was starting to look around, okay, how can we parse JavaScript? Um, there's a parser monkey, uh, sorry, spider monkey API in Firefox, which I, that's what I started using, but it wasn't exposed in a particular easy way to use. But then I discovered um, a Esprima a Esprima is a JavaScript parser written in JavaScript, so you can use it from something like a web page or whatever. Um, and that's what I initially um, used to prototype a tool, and then we ended up moving to Acorn by uh, Marion Haverbeck, Bike. Um, and uh, that was just because it was a bit more lightweight, it had an easier API. But um, anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how this works. Okay, so what, a, a, what these parsers do is they parse the JavaScript into something called AST. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with this if uh, you've used uh, Linter, which I'll get to. But um, basically, it takes a given string. So we've got a code string on the left here. Um, and it breaks it down into the, the nodes, or like a, a tree of nodes that describe exactly what's happening in the code there. Um, so we have, for this thing on the left here, we have a member expression where you have a node called node, Oh, sorry, an identifier called node with a member, a property, sorry, called in HTML. And then that's in, contained within an, assign, an assignment expression where the right-hand side 
is an identifier. And so this is, this is one where it's potentially dangerous. It's only going to be XSS if this dangerous input actually comes from somewhere dangerous. We can't really know that from just looking at the AST. Um, but something we can know is if the right-hand side of it is just a string, we know that's definitely not XSS because, well, unless we've done something spectacular with the string that we're assigning, but um, it's, it's almost certainly not a bug. So this was basically the premise of this tool. Oh, this is how, it, how I started looking into this. So um, I wrote a tool called Scan.js, which is essentially just a, it walks the AST and then evaluates a bunch of rules on all of the nodes looking for certain things. So for example, you could write these little rules like eval, and if you'd ever found a function node with the name of eval, it would, it would find that. Um, it had a few things like the unsafe keyword. So unsafe means all of the nodes below here, are, at least one of them is an identifier. Uh, because when you, when you sort of drill down to the bottom, everything is either a literal or an identifier or maybe something else. But anyway, at least that we, we know that they're not all literals. So we know that it's not definitely safe. So then you can write a rule like I've got here, which is in a HTML, um, so any dot in a HTML equals unsafe, and that finds all of the um, the pattern that I was showing in the previous slide, which is described there. So how do you actually use this? So this is still up. You can use this. Uh, you can play with this. Um, it was written in 2013, so it only it kind of buffs if you use it on any sort of new JavaScript code because it doesn't know what let or um, arrow syntax or anything like that is. But you give it some code, and you can see here that, so it's flagging on line six and seven, which is these ones over here, where we, we it might be uh, XSS. The top two, well, the first one is only reading the attribute, and the second one it's assigning, but all of the things that it's assigning are strings. So we don't, um, don't need to worry about those. So not super sophisticated, but that actually got us a long way with Firefox OS because that allowed us to basically take an app and quickly look at the, uh, the code and see, okay, well, let's get an idea of what sort of patterns they're using. And we could quite easily, like you could look at an app and you you'd generally get maybe 10 or 20 of these sort of places. So it's down to a number that then we could audit. Um, the, I guess the, the limitations was this is, this is only really giving us sort of interesting places in the code. It's not giving us bugs per se. Um, and so mostly it was used for supporting code review. Um, uh, yeah, so what we really would like to have is some data flow analysis um, to be able to say, okay, if we have a ver an identifier like this, how can we tell where this actually comes from? Um, I'm gonna come back to that though, because for well, a number of reasons. Anyway, um, Around the same time, we had some um, bug reports from um, uh, sort of a reporter, uh, sorry, a researcher named Daniel DeFries. Um, I, the name of the university escapes me, but anyway, he wrote a paper called The First Look at Firefox OS Security. And they started using Dataflow in kind of a clever way. Uh, it was a very naive sort of Dataflow because at, at that time, there wasn't much around in terms of tooling for doing Dataflow with um, uh, JavaScript. There's a few sort of academic projects, but not much in terms of uh, software or publicly available code. Um, but the bug that he found was really interesting. So um, if you're familiar with post message um, API in web code, um, you basically it works like this. You have a, you have to register an event listener for the message event. And within that, you do some processing. But that message can potentially be coming cross-origin. So it's kind of on the web page to enforce that you check that the origin and make sure that um, it's coming from a trusted origin or something you trust. So what he had observed with that, or what his team had observed, was, well, if we have a function like this up the top here, you will see that we have the event object, but nowhere in that function is event.origin actually accessed. So if you can figure out enough data flow to figure out that, okay, this is a function and it's to do with the message uh, event listener and there is no access to event.origin, you know that it's missing a check. Now that might not be, a, that may not be a security issue, but in this case it was. So the problem with the notes app was that a web page could, you could embed a, web, uh, a note that had a web page in it, which could then post message up to the notes app log you into a malicious account and then exfiltrate all of your notes to that account. So it was actually a really cool bug. Um, 
kind of a simple mistake and a bit annoying that we didn't fix it, but nice catch. Um, and so, yeah, so that's um, not strictly data flow, I guess, but it was, I guess, being able to have a bit more of reasoning around scope um, allows you to do more powerful rules. Um, the next step, I actually started talking to a company called Semmel, who produced, at the time, they just started doing um, JavaScript data flow analysis. And at that time, Semmel was more focused on code quality. Um, but uh, they were interested in security, and we started working, like, trying to prototype um, some rules specifically for this inner HTML issue. Um, fortunately, also around that time, uh, that was about when Firefox OS kind of, ran, uh, well, we pivoted to IoT. Um, and so we kind of, we, we started this and we, we didn't, uh, didn't take it to its end. But I'm going to revisit that later in the presentation because it's interesting where it ended up. Okay, so Firefox OS, well, it's not cancelled. It kind of went through a bunch of pivots. So we went to IoT, connected devices, and then a whole range of different things. But I, I, not long after that pivot, I ended up back on the Firefox security team and uh, with all my team. So that was cool. Um, the good news in terms of all the work that we put in before, well, Firefox front end code is actually mostly JavaScript um, and a mixture of weirdness, but I don't need to worry about that. Um, the other great news or bad news or whatever, depending on why you want to think about it, is that it also contains a hell of a lot of inner HTML. In fact, to this day, that's a search from yesterday. That's looking for assignments in HTML. Well, there's more than a thousand. Admittedly, most of it's in template code and libraries and stuff, but, uh, but that doesn't worry me anymore, and I'll tell you why. So one of the, my folks uh, in, the, in my team called Frederick Braun, he sort of started to realize that what we'd written with Scan.js was essentially just kind of a crappy linter. Um, ESLint was written around the same time in 2013, and he ported the rule that we'd written in Scan.js to be a lint plugin, um, and then run that across Firefox code base, and we found a bunch of bugs in, uh, so, these are what's called Zool injection bugs. I don't know if you, if you follow Firefox at all, you might have seen that we've just killed off Zool, but Zool is like a, it's like a templating language for UI, um, and it's all XML. But basically, if, again, if it's, it's XSS, it's code execution on the machine. Um, so a bunch of serious bugs, um, but even better, by this time, Firefox had integrated the linter into its normal build system. So the plan here was, well, if we've got a rule here that now prevents this sort of thing, can we just, can we, can we just ban this, this whole assigning to inner HTML thing? Can we just get rid of it? Well, as you saw, there were a lot of them, so it was actually a pretty big job. Uh, oops. Yeah, so actually I just basically talked about all that. But yeah, so the plan is basically find all the places we assign to inner HTML. We fix all the places, then we land the rule, and we never let developers do that ever again, and we're going to be all great. Unfortunately, turns out there's actually a lot of reason why you might want to use in HTML. Um, performance reasons was one of them. Um, deleting a node was quicker just to assign an empty string to inner HTML than using the DOM to delete a node. Again, back in 2014 or 2015, whenever this was. Um, anyways, so we can't get rid of it entirely. All right, well, we'll just we'll look at all these places that we can't get rid of. We'll make sure they're secure, and then we'll ban it. And then we'll just land a, a, this, this rule here which disables ESLint for the next, the, specifically the next line. So then in theory, developers can't land new code that's broken and we know all the current code is safe. So we're good, right? Who, who thinks we're good? <laughs> yeah, nah. Um, so what's the problem? The problem is code change, right? Your code base is changing all the time. And so we audit these things at a particular point in time. And as it turns out, um, even though we had like rules and stuff so that if you ever added a new HTML, it would like send an email to the security team and it would like, it actually come up with a warning on the developer's machine saying, you have done a bad thing, please contact the security team. That was fun. Um, but the, yeah, the problem was you could change the code that was before that dangerous line. So it was safe at one point and then we have a new data flow. So this particular bug was... Um, it's to do with localization, but it was around extensions. You could have an extension that had a name of something that was untrusted. Because extension names needed to be localized, um, that data has to come from the extension, and it may, oh, like we, we don't know what it's, it should just be a string, but for whatever reason, oh, I guess, I think it was because you, in certain languages you need, um, 
HTML characters to express like um, accents or something. I can't remember why it needed HTML, but anyway, it did. And so we have the same old thing before with the untrusted data flowing into uh, HTML. Luckily, someone in the Firefox team discovered this bug and they fixed it uh, before anyone else knew about it. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of other things that we did at the same time. So we improved the static analysis, but there's been a bunch of things we do at runtime. Now, if you ever do an, a, a, in a HTML assignment inside Firefox that's privileged, it actually automatically runs a sanitizer to strip it um, to prevent exactly this sort of bug. So if you're interested in that, there's a link in the slides to Freddie's blog post about this whole exercise. And so, yeah, go and have a look at that. But still, the problem is we don't have um, data flow, right? Um, because if we had have had data flow, we might have been able to see, okay, there's a new path. So a few years ago, uh, I got reconnected with some of the SEML folks through a colleague. And by this time, SEML had pivoted, and they're now more focused on doing, looking for security bugs. Um, so we started looking at Firefox. And most of the work I've done has been in C++, but I'm going to go through an example of um, using data flow in JavaScript um, to actually use static analysis to find new bugs so this is really cool because previously we'd sort of just been using it for eradication, but this, uh, this sort of method allows us to take a bug that we know about, figure out a pattern that is um, uh, potentially bad, and then uh, look for similar types of patterns. And it's, it's really powerful. It's this example we'll show. Um, I definitely don't have time to explain what SEML is, but in a nutshell, uh, it takes your code base, it turns it into a database, like a, just a relational database, which you then write queries for that look like a bit of a mishmash between SQL and Java, um, which might sound terrifying, but it's actually, it's cool. Um, and then you run that query and then you get some query results. Uh, yeah. So the bug I'm going to talk about, uh, you may have heard about this. This was happened in uh, July, I think it was, this year. Um, Coinbase got in touch with Firefox. They'd been hit with some targeted O-Day. Fun, fun. Um, and the sandbox escape was uh, in the JavaScript code uh, in Firefox. Basically, what had happened was that there was a prompt message that would come uh, from a compromised child process and uh, be sent to the parent, and that would allow, uh, the, it would cause the parent to open a remote web page. Um, I'm trying to think about, well, let me just, a bit of context. Uh, Multiprocess Firefox has a parent process, which is like the empowered can do everything any, on your system sort of thing. Web, con actually run, web content runs in these sandboxes. Um, and then there's IPC messaging going between. So in this case, the message from the child would then tell the parent, hey, load some remote content. But instead of loading it in one of these processes, it would load it up here, um, which is bad. Uh, this might sound very platform specific and whatever, but this is actually a pretty common pattern in like every web application in, since the history of ever. Whenever you have messages passing across a tr trust boundary, you have exactly this situation. Um, so what did the actual bug look like? Um, so we have basically this receive, oh, wrong button. This receive message function is the call in the parent that receives the IPC message. Here, it would take that, We'd then extract a URL from that message, and then we'd use uh, an open window function to then load it. And the problem was, yeah, that this, this URL, this open window function was only supposed to be used for like loading Chrome dialogues. Uh, confusingly, uh, pr privileged content in Firefox is, is called a Chrome page. We were first, all right? <laughs> um, anyway, so the idea here is that we then, we can try and model that bug in QL, QL is the name of the language that, uh, that SEML has created. Um, this might be a bit overwhelming, but this is basically the pattern for doing data flow in, um, in, in QL. Uh, you probably don't even need to look at the top part mostly. Mostly the interesting stuff is down the bottom here. And this is basically just a way of expressing what I've sort of been saying all along. We have a source, a source node, we have a sync node, um, and we want to know where is there a path between the two? And that's, that's as simple as that, which is, is super powerful. Um, how do we actually define which of the source and which is the sync is just this is source and is sync function. Um, so in this particular case, we want to match this thing at the top. 
this uh, receive message function. And in fact, just an aside, one of the, the challenging things about all of this is um, I was like, okay, we just need to look for functions called receive message. Well, in JavaScript, if you've got a structure like this, actually this thing is a property right because JavaScript. And it, uh, yeah, it's, com anyways. So actually learning like the, you have to sort of have a familiarity with the, the language specification, which I found that was probably the most challenging part. But anyways, similar folks helped uh, with getting some of that right and writing a query. So we have now a thing that matches, okay, if we have a property right called receive message, and then the right hand side of it is a function which takes a parameter, well, that's our node. That's the thing we're interested in. So that's gonna, that's gonna match on this little message thing here, right? Then the next thing we want to match, we want to match on the URL because that's the argument we care about. So again, we write a thing, okay, we say we, have a, we want a method called open window, and we want the second argument starts at zero, but yeah. So again, the node that we're interested in is this one here. And then putting it all together, that allows us to track the data flow. Um, it's, it's a tainting data flow, so it doesn't matter that it's not just the same variable that's passed down here, because there is like taint from here, which goes from then um, URL becomes tainted because it comes from message, and then URL is passed down here. It's actually, I'm totally simplifying this, there was a lot more steps, but um, that's the idea. And so that was great. That allowed me to do one thing, first of all, was that we got it working and it found the bug and it didn't find any other bugs. So that was, woo, fantastic. Um, for a given value of fantastic. For the similar reasons that we looked at before, it's only as powerful as how accurate that this modeling is. Because if there's JavaScript, you can do some crazy things. And in fact, in Firefox JavaScript, you can do some even crazier things. You can call into C++ and C++ will call back. And we probably can't trust that our static analysis is gonna reliably track that data flow. So, we, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But one of the powerful things you can do is say, well, let's look for something else. So using the same source, but looking for a different sync. So this, this particular string here is a, it's privileged JavaScript code. This is the code that's inside Firefox when you call um, uh, like the location API or the camera API, and you get the prompt that comes up and like you click okay or whatever. It, that code inside the Firefox will then go, okay, the user has said okay, now we'll give that permission, we'll give the camera permission or the location permission to that web page. Um, so in this, so what I did was uh, create, ex change the sync method to now look for, okay, we want a global um, variable called services, which has a property called perms, which has a method called add from principles, which takes any argument, and that's gonna be my sync. So I could literally just run exactly the same query that I did before, except with this different sync, and boom. We have another issue. This one was to do with the, um, the Flash blocker in uh, Firefox. When you try and load Flash for the last couple of years, Firefox will go, eh, are you sure you wanna run Flash? Because you know Flash can be dicey. Uh, and it, so you have this thing called click to play, and if you click yes, it gives you the um, Flash permission. Unfortunately, uh, I want to scroll back the picture, but basically the thing that was saying, hey, please give me the flash permission was actually the child process. And it was just saying, hey, the user has definitely told me that they definitely want to run flash. Please give this permission, which is a string called flash. Now you could just say, actually the user has also said the camera permission and the location permission and all these other secret permissions that we have inside Firefox that allow you to do funky things. So it was a sandbox escape basically. Um, it's not too serious because it wasn't a code execution thing. It, all it really allows you to do is um, you could get a weird permission and there was user interaction. Um, so this, is, this was fixed just last week actually. Um, but yeah, it proves the, I don't know, it proves the hypothesis. Yes, we can use static analysis to find bugs. So this was actually really exciting because I sort of spent a lot of time and this is one of the first really like concrete examples of, yeah, this works great. So anyways, um, coming back to Firefox OS, while I was writing this talk, I thought, oh, you know, just for, for giggles, I'll, I'll run um, Gaia back through. This is uh, Semmel's um, cloud service called LGTM. You can use it for free for any, uh, any open source stuff. So you can just point it at a, um, a repo and it will analyze it and run its standard queries and you can, whatever. Oh God, I think we missed something. Oh, no, no. 
okay, it was only demo code, but still, it was a bit, uh, well, it was actually really, really validating the fact that, I mean, it's really cool to see that technology has come uh, far enough now that, like, you can do this sort of powerful thing. So that was, I don't know, it was cool. <laughs> um, so how would we have not had that bug? Well, what we really needed is we needed continuous integration. So that was one of the problems with ScanJS. It was something you ran man manually, and it was much better when we moved to ESLint, and, you, you know, you're constantly um, running it. Um, I guess the, the ideal thing, though, is with the CI, or at least the thing that I found, is we we have like alerts running daily looking for security bugs, and we have them sending to the security team. The challenge with that is sometimes you'll get a you'll get a report and it looks bad, but to actually find out if it's exploitable or not requires a really in-depth knowledge of that particular part of the code base. And that can, you can spend a day just digging through and figuring out and whatever, and, and then, then finding out, oh, actually, there's a, we check it something somewhere else over here, and it's not a bug. And so we started, when we first started doing this, we're like, this is just creating work for us, and it's not like, it's, it's the, I, the easiest thing would be to ask the developer. In fact, I'd often end up doing that. I'm like, how can we make this better? So it's actually, if you can integrate it into your build steps such that, like, it's when the developer runs their build, and then that's when it catches it, and it's right in front of them. It's when they have the context of the code they're working on loaded into their mind. It's easier for them to go, no, that's not a bug, just ignore it, or, yeah, actually, that's a problem, and I fix it straight away. So that's the dream. Um, but sometimes with the static analysis, it takes a long time to run, uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, Especially on the project the size of Firefox and, and even big web applications, things like that, you're gonna have you're not gonna be able to provide enough feedback to slow you don't wanna slow down the build step, right? Like if a developer has to wait two hours to get feedback to find out whether or not all the security rules passed, yeah, they're gonna turn that, that stuff off real quick. So one way one thing we've done at Firefox is um, create a thing called ReviewBot, which takes input from tools that run asynchronously. So we've got a, a variety of different static analysis tools, so Clang and some proprietary ones as well. And it will go and if it finds a bug that was caused by a particular patch on a particular try build, it will then go and post in the bug, uh, the issue tracker, that you, um, hey, there's something has failed. And basically it's like an automated review. Um, and that was, that was really powerful because it, it solved the problem of static analysis taking a long, uh, long time, but it still got the information in front of the developer when it was still sort of front of mind, uh, which is really what you, what you want. Um, I found writing custom rules to be the most like, powerful. Like we run a lot of different static analysis tools. Um, you, can, you can certainly find bugs, but of, often it's more around hardening and stuff you get with, with sort of the default rule sets. I found, especially I, maybe it was because we were working on kind of esoteric code, the ability to write custom rules is super powerful. It's very time consuming. Um, so you have to sort of ask yourself, am I actually going to find bugs with this and is it worth investing the time? But uh, yeah, that's, I think that's where a lot of the value is. Um, and it also depends on how you're going to use the tool. Like if you're going to use it like auditing in a similar manner to what I was talking about with the ScanJS tool, you don't really care so much about false positives because you just want to find out, you know, get a feeling for the code, is it secure or not. But if you're trying to use it in CI, you really need to have a low false positive rate because otherwise you're creating a lot of unnecessary work. Um, and it totally depends on what technology is available, um, like what, la what tools are available for the language and thing. That's what sort of was difficult with JavaScript. Um, uh, definitely start simple. Um, as you saw, I started very, very simply, and we got a long way with that. So um, you can get a long way with grep, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the, the main thing is really you have to understand the code. So you need to have that step or that feedback loop in your security assurance program that when people are reporting security bugs or you're discovering security bugs, that someone is actually looking at those and understanding, hey, is there a pattern here? Is there something like, hey, we saw a similar bug a few months ago. Maybe that's, you know, maybe it's related. Maybe we can do something to improve the code base. Um, and it's only useful for certain types of bugs, right? You, I, this was an easy sell at Mozilla because everyone loves automation. You can get more stuff done and all those sort of things. But certainly diving into this stuff, we found that some things are just too difficult to model from a static analysis perspective, or there's some limitations, or there's maybe there's some external input, maybe you're working with another system, and you can't model that particularly effectively. So it, it really, it's, it is, it's powerful for some classes of bugs and then not so others. So um, I guess it's just a tool that you use in conjunction with the rest of your other tools, like fuzzing or um, whatever else you have in automation. Uh, and yeah, 
be a little bit skeptical of your analysis, as you saw. Don't, don't, don't get too excited about thinking that you've completely solved security forever. Um, so some final conclusions. Uh, static analysis can be a useful tool for both buzzing investigation and bug prevention. Um, you need to understand your issues first. The shorter the feedback circuit between the developer and the rules, the more efficient it's going to be. Um, and definitely use it in conjunction with other, other controls, so application controls, fuzzing, whatever else. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I'll just pass the mic around. Here we go. Thanks a lot, Paul. Where are you off to next? Uh, Atlassian in a couple of weeks. Super pumped. <laughs> Any Atlassian folks here? There's one somewhere, maybe. Oh. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, very excited. Another um, question over here. Is there any automation tool to test this, like uh, to test this vulnerabilities and anything? Uh, so, I, I guess SEML pitches it itself as an automation tool, like. Um, they have APIs to integrate with uh, bug trackers and things like that, and and they actually the it runs continuously. So we have it running like daily on Firefox builds. Um, you for other things like Clang and Linters, we we've built our own automation tools. So I guess it's just part of the build scripts and things like that. And then we rely on alerting and things like that. So I guess it's custom. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other things out there. I know of at least three or four other static analysis tools. Um, that do similar sorts of things. So there's, there's a lot out there. So it really depends on the languages you're using and, and um, well, what, about what's available. Yeah. yeah. How, how accurate is the tool like SIML? Um, how, um, how close does it get to the actual semantics and execution? Oh. With, a, with a tool like, uh, like SIML, how close does it actually get to the execution uh, model and semantics of a given language such as JavaScript? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm probably, I would definitely not call myself a static analysis expert, so um, I, I, I know they actually describe in some of the SEML documentation some of the limitations of the JavaScript data flow analysis. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but certain patterns where, because in JavaScript you can do some, you know, you can take a string and use it as an array index and then I, I can't remember exactly which things are covered and which things are not. Um, but yeah, they, they do provide some like sort of guidance in terms of what it covers. Certainly in, in terms of Firefox, the cross um, process boundary stuff was a challenge. Also the, you can call into C++ and it would come back. That was really, basically we have to model that in two separate queries and it's, it becomes really difficult. Um, so yeah. Um, Any other questions at the front? Yeah, what do you think of um, stronger languages coming in, like TypeScript for the front end? Now you have Rust by Mozilla. Look, I, I think it's fantastic. I I spent most of my time with static analysis on C++. I definitely the return on investment was higher there, just because well, you, you can write much more powerful queries, and you can trust. I mean, we've spent years and years. And Mozilla has static analysis Clang plugins for years and years, so there's a lot of annotations and things that I could potentially leverage. Whereas JavaScript was. Uh, because it's so flexible, it's difficult. To, like you can't you can't look at a type of something and go, okay, I only care about a URL type or a string type or something like that. Because unless you're using TypeScript, you don't have that information. So yeah, I, it was more powerful. Um, yeah, so if you can use TypeScript, I, I would imagine you could do more powerful things, and you could do you could have more powerful assertions, especially in terms of trying to prevent code, for sure. Just in the middle. Yeah, about SAML, uh, how are the rules already? So can you, can you get a good result with the, with the rules in SAML scan or you need to customize them to get a better result? Well, that example there was the rule was out of the box, right? So that, that, box? The, 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 the last example in Firefox OS, the one, that I, the one that we'd missed, the one that got away, that was their out of the box rules. So, okay. um, and how fast is the scan? So, or if you do the repeat, repeat you know, just oh, frequent it, scanning? It, it totally depends. Um, it, like, it depends on the language. It, so for JavaScript, it doesn't have to do a build step. Um, it just looks through the code because it's just interpreted. But for C++, it, it does a normal build. My experience that a build, it, 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 it obviously depends on how much, um, uh, see how many CPUs and stuff you throw at it. On a local build, it was taking about three, three, three or four times the normal build time. 
okay. to actually build. Okay, and if so, you do the re, you know, frequent scanning, does it really change it? Oh, Should well, see, once, that's the, one of the nice things with SEML is once you've got the actual um, the database built, mm -hmm. the query is actually pretty quick. So it's minutes. Even a complex query, you're talking five, ten minutes, as opposed to doing the scanning while it's building. Because a lot of other tools, the scanning actually happens during the build phase, so you just have to do a full build every time you want to scan. So that is, that's kind of a neat thing. Um, it, and it depends if you run the entire query suite, it takes a long time. And in fact, that's one, one limitation you'll find with the, the free offering is the queries will eventually time out. So if you're doing it across a lot of things, um, you might find that the queries time out. Um, and then you have to pay for it, but yeah. yeah so. Still got one or two more minutes. Any more questions? All right, let's, uh, let's thank Paul again. Thank you Cheers. again. Thank you.